Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Think about what these words would have meant to the Jews facing God's judgment nearly 2,600 years ago. They're deported, they're in exile, and they're discouraged. And then they hear from out of nowhere these words, comfort, comfort all my people. Well, these are the opening words of Isaiah chapter 40. And today we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 40 in our study in the key chapters of God's word. Now, Isaiah chapter 40 is one of the more well-known chapters in the book of Isaiah because it contains a famous passage. This is a passage that's often like in greeting cards or even like athletes will put this like onto a football or something like that. It's just even a passage of comfort and hope and inspiration. It's Isaiah 40, 30, and 31. And it says, Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Those are encouraging words, but they become even more encouraging and more powerful when we understand them in the overall context of the book of Isaiah. If you wanted a basic outline of the book of Isaiah, chapters 1 to 39 represent judgment. Chapters 40 to 66 represent restoration. In fact, Isaiah is sometimes described as a mini Bible because there are 66 chapters in Isaiah and there are 66 books in the Bible, 39 books in the Old Testament and 39 chapters of judgment in Isaiah, 27 books in the New Testament and 27 chapters of restoration in Isaiah as well. Now, I'm not saying that the Old Testament is all about judgment, but just recognizing that distinction helps us to see the incredible shift that's now taking place in this book. In fact, this shift is so significant that liberal scholars say that the second section of Isaiah has just got so much hope and grace in it, it's got to be written by somebody else. Now, I totally disagree with that. Like, for one thing, although Isaiah wrote these words, they were inspired by the Lord. And this shift of focus here makes complete sense when we just understand God's message. All along from Isaiah chapter 1 to 39, God's been just talking about this covenant he's made with his people and how they're just breaking that covenant. They're going to be suffering his judgment. And yet, at the same time, this change in focus is completely consistent with the message of Isaiah in chapters 1 to 39. We've just been reading about how God had made a covenant with Abraham, that he will keep that covenant regardless of Israel's obedience. And yet, the people of God had broken their end of the covenant. And so, God is going to be faithful to the whole Mosaic covenant, including the, the warnings of judgment. But they'll also be seeing restoration, which is consistent with the Abrahamic covenant. And that's exactly what we're seeing here in the book of Isaiah. And so up till now, God's just been laying out this indictment against the northern and southern kingdoms. He's even brought some judgment upon the nations of the world. And yet we have also seen God promising that there's going to be this other kingdom coming, this new kingdom coming. It's going to be filled with covenant keepers who are God's people who will follow God's ways. That new kingdom will be ruled by the Messiah and he will gather his people from around the world to himself at the end of time. And so now as we turn to Isaiah chapter 40, we're leaving behind all of those prosecutorial sections of Isaiah, all of those sections of judgment in Isaiah, and now we're turning to the sections that focus on God's grace and mercy for his people. And so now God's message is that of comfort. And you think about this, this is what the people would need now, because the first 39 chapters are one of judgment. It's just promising the exile is coming. Well, it comes, and now God is speaking prophetically to those who are in the exile. They need hope to cling to while they are just suffering God's discipline. They need to know that God is disciplining them as a father, not as a ruthless dictator. And here, Isaiah is even prophetically speaking to these people in captivity, because this captivity won't begin for well over 100 years from now. Isaiah is going to be long gone. But Isaiah is still writing to them in that captivity, bringing to them the Lord's message of comfort. And so verses 1 and 2 says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And so here we're seeing that Israel has received this drastic penalty for her disobedience, but when her punishment has been completed, she will be restored. And so to announce this, verse 3 says, A voice is calling, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Now that probably sounds familiar because it's applied to John the Baptist in several places in the New Testament. Going on, verse 4 says, Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so the coming of this new kingdom is going to be spectacular in its hope and inspiration, its visibility. The glory of God will be seen around the earth. All people will see it. And how do we know this is true? Well, verse 8 tells us these promises, these are the words of God, they will stand forever. And so here's God's message to these exiled Jews. God still has a plan for them and he will still come for them. 
as we go on to this chapter, we now see the nature of this coming one who is going to establish this kingdom. Verse 9 says, Get yourself on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Notice that the end of verse 9 says, Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. And so the one who's going to come and establish this kingdom is God himself. Verse 10 goes on to say, Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Verse 11 says, Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom, and he will gently lead the nursing ewes. And so you just imagine the words of comfort here. They hear the people are in exile or hearing that their God is going to come for them and carry them out in his very arms. Now, as we look at this passage here, Let's also pause and just see that this is also talking about the Trinity. I mean, the Trinity in the Old Testament? Yeah, it's right here. Because who is the one who is going to shepherd this flock? Well, we know it's Jesus. Jesus tells us in John 10, verses 14 to 16, he says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. And so clearly, Jesus is the good shepherd mentioned in John 10. It's also being prophesied here in Isaiah 40. But notice also what this passage says about this good shepherd. Verse 10 says, the Lord God will come with might. But yet, look at that word God. It's capitalized there. And that means it's actually the covenant name of Yahweh. And it's just translated that way because you have the Lord, Lord, and they just made it Lord God with the God being capitalized. Just be clear that it is the Yahweh who is the Lord here. And so it is the Lord who is coming. It is Yahweh who is coming. And yet, as we look at these verses, we're seeing this just going back and forth between God the Father and God the Son. Because in verse 12, the Lord has measured out the waters in his hand. He has marked off the heavens and weighed the mountains. And so we're seeing God being spoken about in verses 10, 11, also the Son as the good shepherd. But then in verse 13, notice who's being spoken about. Verse 13 now shifts to the Holy Spirit. And it says, Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? And so suddenly now Isaiah is talking about the Spirit, whom we call the Holy Spirit. And here in this passage, you have all three persons of the Trinity being spoken about here. You can see they're distinct, and yet they're all united together as well. And this is talking about the Trinity, but it's not the only passage in the book of Isaiah that talks about the Trinity. So does Isaiah 42, 1, 44, 3, 48, 16, and also Isaiah 59, 21. We'll look at these, most of these passages as we go through the book of Isaiah together. So in addition to this being this fantastic book about judgment, restoration, and, and hope and mercy and grace, the book of Isaiah is also one of the most powerful Old Testament witnesses for the Trinity. Now, I suspect even that when Jesus arrived in the scene and was teaching people about his nature as God the Son, I would imagine that people were like, oh yeah, now I see how these pieces come together. I was wondering, I remember that from Isaiah or in Genesis 1, and, and they have been studying God's word and just seeing how everything just now fits together and just recognizing it and, and totally seeing this and believing it as well. Continuing on in Isaiah chapter 40, the next set of verses focuses on the nature of God, and it teaches us of God's strength and his power, his love and his wisdom. In verse 17, he's not entangled in the affairs of nations. Uh, All of their accomplishments, all that stuff, basically meaningless to him. He's certainly not intimidated by anything that men can do. And then verse 18 lets us know there's nothing we can make that would reflect God. Uh, Verse 19, he's not a silly idol to be made with human hands. In verse 22, he sits above this entire universe. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain. In verse 23, he has the power to reduce rulers to nothing. In verse 25, there is nothing that is his equal. And so in verse 29, Isaiah calls us to to just set our eyes above everything in this universe, even beyond the stars, to the very creator behind them. God has named every star. We can't even number the stars, let alone name them. And yet God has named every star and not one of them is outside of his control. And because of all this in verse 27, it's foolish to try to hide anything from the Lord. He knows everything that's going on in our lives. It's all just laid out before him. Our job is to fear him, trust him, and obey him. And then we come to this famous passage at the end of Isaiah, in verse 28 to 31. In Isaiah 40, verse 28, it says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. I'm here he's put these stars in the heavens. He's stretched out them out like a curtain, yet he's not weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable, goes on to say at the end of verse 28. Verse 29, he gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youth grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord 
will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. And so you see just this incredible promise of just hope and restoration that when God comes, he will strengthen his people to do his work. We can put our hope and trust in him. And so because of all of these promises that we have seen so far, all of the promises from chapter 1 to 39, all the promises of judgment, all of those things have come to pass. And just as they came to pass for the exile, they will also come to pass for the restoration. We can trust God. He will bring this about. God's power is awesome and without any diminishment. He has wisdom to work out the details that bring this to pass. He's not bound by the nations. He's not worried about them. God's will will be done. In verse 27, he's not going to get worn out. In verse 29, he'll give strength to his people as well. And in verse 30, when people get worn on out, those who trust in him, they'll be renewed on up and strengthened just to do God's work and to do God's will. And so the restoration we're talking about here, this is of a spiritual source. And therefore, those who wait for the Lord will be strengthened supernaturally. Those who wait for him will be able to rise above their situations supernaturally. Those who wait for him will will run and not grow tired and walk and not become weary. They will have his grace strengthening them and empowering them to do his work. So that's Isaiah chapter 40 in a nutshell. Again, this is just a passage we may know already, but just seeing it in context makes it that much more powerful. Once again, think about what it'd be like to be reading these words if you were a person sitting in exile under God's judgment. Here you are in exile. The Babylonians have come and they've just defeated your city. They may have even killed people you've known. They've taken you and carted you away from everything you've ever grown up with. And now you're in this foreign land with foreigners all around you. You recognize this is the hand of God because he had prophesied these things would happen. And then as you look around in dismay and say, what have I done? What do we do now? Where where do we go from here? And someone whispers into your ear, be comforted. Wait for the Lord. He has the wisdom and the power to solve this thing, to bring about true restoration. He will strengthen you. He will return. He will establish his kingdom upon this earth. You are not done. You are not forsaken. He will bring you into it. Those words would have meant so much to God's people in those days, not just as the warnings of judgment, but also the promises of restoration. And God's people would have lived their lives in light of this hope. Now, Isaiah 40 is speaking about when the Lord comes to establish his kingdom. And yet these promises in their kernel form are also for us today as well. We may be facing a difficulty or adversity. We may have had some kind of problem. Maybe it's by our own fault. We're like, what do I do now? I, what do I go from here? I'm just done. I've, I, God said, don't do this. I did it. I suffered the judgment and consequences. Now what? Well, the same grace that God gives the people here in Isaiah 40, he will give to you as well. Uh, come to him, repent, submit these things to him, and let him lead you out of that difficulty you're in. And if your heart is one of repentance, God has not abandoned you. He will come and meet with you and be with you and strengthen you in that time. Also, this passage is just a great reminder for us about the importance of waiting for the Lord no matter what's going on. To wait for the Lord means to be constantly looking to him, to be constantly trusting his promises, constantly letting him lead and getting behind him and following him. This is a key spiritual principle to living biblically. And those who learn to wait for the Lord they'll have strength. They'll have strength to work, strength to pray, strength to resist, strength to endure, strength to obey, strength to serve, and strength to worship and praise. And for us as New Covenant Christians, this is possible because we have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit within us, renewing us and enabling us just to transform our lives by His grace and for His glory. And so as we close out our time together today, how about just seeking God's grace to be renewed in Him, to be continually waiting for Him, to be strengthened by Him, that he might do his work in this world, constantly looking to him for his coming, for his return, that we may one day join him in his kingdom as his people together worshiping him. That's gonna be a great day. Well, with that, we'll leave things there. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.